we're going. All right. Well, will you come and lead us in a word of prayer to sure. you again? And then we'll get started. I'm excited. I'm so excited you guys can join me, and this is going to be a really fun class. Yes, it is. I apologize for being a few minutes late, but let's go ahead and have a word of prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessings towards us for this beautiful day and this opportunity to have this class. I pray that you will bless each one who is listening in live and those who are watching later, and uh, that this may be a blessing and improve the health of many. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, are you ready to get started? We're going to make a loaf of gluten-free bread today. And so like I said, uh, because we're going to have to wait for it to rise, uh, I'm going to just dive into the recipe first, and then I'll do the introduction. How does that sound? Um, slight different format than I normally do. But if you want to follow along with this recipe that I'm demonstrating, if you go to our website, uh, christinaskitchen.org, you will uh, click on recipes and then click on gluten-free baking and scroll down until you see the recipe that's called gluten-free millet bread. That's the recipe that I'm gonna be making right now. And uh, if you can't access it right now, you can always look it up later. There's a handy dandy print thing on it. You can print it and uh, print it on the piece of paper and which is what I just did. So I am gonna be demonstrating straight off the website. So. Uh, or I can, you can just look in the comments and I'll put the link in the comments. Or you can look in the comments and Daniel's going to put a link in there from the comments for you. So that's a great place to start too. So to start with, uh, this is a millet bread. So you need millet flour. Um, I'll let you turn it, Lexi, if I end up out of the camera. Uh, we grind our own millet flour because it's a whole lot cheaper. And uh, the other thing that you need, um, you do not have to have a grinder. You can buy millet flour, okay? Uh, but if you're gonna make a lot of millet bread, it's cheaper with a grinder. Um, so this is our millet flour, and we'll talk more about that later. And then you have to have a scale of some sort, and a bowl, and uh, a whisk. And that's pretty much all you need <coughs> to make this bread, okay? Um, it's not very hard, but we're gonna turn the scale on with the bowl on it, so that way it will be at zero. And everything is in grams, don't let that scare you. The first ingredient is 300 grams of millet flour. It's so nice because you don't even have to measure, you just dump it until there's 300 grams in there. And if you put more in, you just take it out. Pretty much any digital scale will go to English or metrics. So you just change yeah, you wanna mode. make sure that you have a scale that will go in grams, um, and uh, that's all you need. Best not to do a portion control scan because most of those are very scale. I said scan, scale, uh, because those are, don't go very high. Um, but uh, as long as you have one that will hold enough weight for your bread, this recipe makes one loaf. So there's our 300 grams of millet flour. Now we need 120 grams of tapioca flour. where we get all these exotic flowers? Uh, not until I am done and this is rising because it takes 30 minutes to rise and I'll have 30 minutes to talk all you want. Okay. okay. There we go. Now, if you want to know <laughs> when you're measuring grams, one gram is about a paper clip, okay? So if your scale is a gram, if, if, if you put a gram too much in there, you're not gonna have to take very much out. Um, okay, the next one is flaxseed. Need 80 grams of flaxseed meal. If you have the meal already ground, you can use that. Um, if you don't have the meal already ground, you just measure it in your grinder. So I'm gonna hit the tear button. So now it says zero with my thing on it. And we're gonna measure eight. Tanya said if you were going to guess how much of the flour is in cups, what would it be? I'm gonna answer that question as soon as I'm done with this. And I will answer it very thoroughly, I promise. But keep typing your questions because uh, then we can go back to them. And then, uh, let's see, chia seed, we need 30 grams. I have a feeling I can get them both in the same grinder here. Let's 
So I just had to hit the tear button again and I can put them both in. 30 grams, how's that? All right, so I've got my flat seed, my chia seed, and this little grinder here. We're gonna grind them together. No barley, no rye, uh, none of those grains that are um, can have traces of gluten in them. So, yes, this is perfect for cilia. Okay, so there's our flax and our chia seed. And now we need our psyllium husk. That's another ingredient we're gonna have to talk about. This is whole husk psyllium. We need 22 grams. Wait, now I better make sure I tear the thing and make sure it says, always make sure it says zero on your scale before you put an ingredient in or else you'll be in trouble. All right, 22 grams. The psyllium seed husk is amazing. That's what's gonna hold the dough together so that we can actually do stuff with it. All right, there's 22 grams of psyllium. We're gonna put that in there. And you know, I've developed this habit since working at the restaurant. We get distracted so much because of telephone calls and customers walk in. I don't know if you can see here, or Daniel, can you uh, make it so that they can see it? Uh, how I'm putting the ingredients in, so that way I know where I'm at on my recipe. You can see the nice, neat little piles there of each thing we're putting in. So you know. Tommy said, I'll just come buy the bread. It's already more involved than I want. <laughs> <laughs> and Rosa Simmons said, you are wearing the flowers, etc. Or you are weighing the flowers, etc. How is the whole WT of the bowls containers counted into the weight? The weight. The weight. The weight. All right. So um, on my scale has a button that's called tear. T-A-R-E. And when I put the bowl on, I hit that tear button so that it says zero with the bowl on before I put my ingredients in. And it makes it very nice um, for that. Uh, you don't have to worry about accounting for the weight. All right, that's our organic sugar. If you don't wanna use sugar, I can tell you a way to change that later as well. And then last of all, we just need salt and yeast, and then we have all our dry ingredients in there. Salt is six grams. Johnny said, hungry, hungry hippo me. <laughs> I'm trying to make you hungry. All right, there's our salt. Just, and then now we need our yeast. Just for fun, can you turn your scale around so we can kind of see what 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 you're what you're doing on that scale? If for... you can tell me what it says because I can't all right, see it we'll, at all. We'll watch it. Corn. We'll watch it. Okay, good because zoom, I don't have the faintest so clue see. how much uh, yeast is in here. All right, now hold on. I want ten grams. I don't know we're what at the six. scale says. Oh, we're at f eleven. 11. Right. We're at eleven. We're at twelve. Yeah. Got too much too much already. <laughs> Why did you make me turn it around? Ah, oh, sorry, sorry. I just. There's no way to reuse the yeast, and I don't have a bowl to put it in. I just dumped um, a little bit out. I always watch the scale very carefully, but yeah. there's no way I can watch it, and you guys are not. All right, all right. You're not helpful. Not helpful. There you go, <laughs> 10. All right, I'll throw that in the trash can. There you go. And see, when you put the bowl on, it's zero because you hit the tear button there on the, on yep. the scale. So I will show you... It's a lot easier to show you on water than on perishable ingredients. Mm -hmm, okay. Um, so we're going to do the water next. So we have all of our ingredients in. As you can see here. Can you see? I don't know if you can see. Yep. Uh, we'll bring that up back again. So you can look at that those piles of ingredients and tell which one is switched. You can see the salt, yeast, tapioca, psyllium husk, chia seed. Okay. Melt flour. Can you All a little right. bit closer? 
Lexi? There you go. All right, so we are gonna whisk all these ingredients together and make sure that we get all the lumps out. And that is the dry ingredients. So there's only two more ingredients in this bread and that is the oil and water. All right, those are dry. Now we're ready for wet. So this, you can watch this. You wanted to see how to do this. Yeah. See, I've switched now. I don't have the bowl that I had before. I have the measuring cup. And see, it says 70 grams. Well, that's not what we want. We want it to say zero. So this tear button right here, I'm gonna hit the button and now it says zero. And now I can put my liquid in there and I know it's just gonna be the weight of my liquid without the measuring cup. So we need 500 milliliters, and believe right. it or not, a milliliter weighs a gram of water. So <laughs> yes, a milliliter yeah. of water weighs a gram. There's a lot of things that don't, but for water it does. So I can yeah, actually 400, weigh 450 or 75. Oh no! Whoa, 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 whoa! I'm getting it all over me. But it's okay. We can we can pour water out. Okay, where are we at now? Oh, look at that, 500. <laughs> that was a wild guess. Okay, so we've got our water in there and now we're gonna put our oil in and you are not gonna see it with the oil because I have to watch that one. You better watch that one, okay. Because I am putting the oil into the water and guess how hard it is to get the oil back out if I put too much in. <laughs> so you just hit tear and tear it with the water. Well, I need 56. Uh, so I'm just going to do it until it says 556. I'm uh, going to tearing it. Same diff. Do the math in your head. I'm going to come over there and make sure you got it exactly at 56. You can when I'm done, but don't scare <laughs> me. It's like, everybody, hold your breath. Christina's going to try to get the exact amount here. So what if you're one gram over? I don't worry about it. What if you're 50 grams over? Uh, you dump it out and try again. <laughs> what did I say I was doing, 56? 56. You got me distracted now. It's 55. All right, one drop. Let's see if we can get it. Let's see if it does 56 or 57. 56. Ah. Do you want, I can, do you want to look to, to prove it? you believe me? Yeah, let's, let, let's see. Let's see if it actually says 56 on it. There you go. There's your proof. What do you know? <laughs> it's easier when I can actually look at it. <laughs> when it's backwards and I'm going by you telling me when, it doesn't work out quite so well. Okay, so now the technique is we are going to mix this water and oil into this dry, and you're going to need to be nice and close so you can see what I'm doing. I hope we aren't making you guys seasick. You want to point it down, Lexi, like Daniel's got? Okay, so when we mix this together, it's going to be like gravy. The idea is to get all the lumps mixed up and out of it in the first like 30 seconds. So we're just gonna pour that all in into the middle and then we're just gonna start whisking. Should the water be warm? That's a good question. Um, and I should have checked that beforehand. Usually I check the water with a thermometer and I totally forgot because I was in a hurry. Um, you do not want the water warm. You want the water about between 68 to 70 degrees. So if it's too warm in the summertime, I have to add ice cubes to it. In the winter, I have to warm it up because the tap water is too cold. So um, a thermometer does do best. Since it's April, you didn't need to check it because it's Well, rate. actually, um, yeah. <laughs> this morning, my water filter gave me warm water and I had to put a half a scoop of ice in every loaf that I made. But as soon as I got through that warm section, the rest of it was the right temperature. So we're okay. All right, so it's done. You can see it's already thickening up. Look at that. See how thick it's already starting to get? We're gonna let this sit for 30 minutes or Looks 25. Like pancake batter, um, thick, thick batter. It's turning thicker than that already. We're gonna let that sit for about 20 minutes or so just so you guys can uh, see what it does. 
and uh, I'm going to answer questions now because it's time to talk about what we just did. There was a lot of new things in there that you've probably never seen, one of which is using a scale. Uh, someone asked me approximately how many cups it is. The answer is I'm not going to tell you. And uh, the reason is because every measuring cup is a different size. So my one cup measuring cup and your cup, one cup measuring cup are probably not the same. And this recipe is actually very sensitive. Uh, you wanna make sure that you get everything precise. Um, so I have measuring cups in my kitchen that are a quarter cup difference in the one cup measuring cup versus another one cup measuring cup. A quarter cup is a lot of play for gluten-free bread when you need precision. And so if you are going to make gluten-free bread, do not use cups. Always use a scale. You don't have to have a big fancy one like this at home. I have a nice tiny little one and uh, they cost less than $15. I love that scale. I use it for weighing packages <laughs> like uh, to see if my first cast mail is too much, needs an extra stamp or not. Um, I use it for making my gluten-free bread. I use it for a lot of things. So it's very handy to have. Plus, as you saw, I didn't have to use any measuring spoons, measuring cups. Um, it makes it very simple. And uh, so number one, if you're going to make gluten-free bread, you need a scale. And they don't cost pretty much. Just go on Amazon. You'll find them. I've seen some for $9.99, uh, $11.99. Um, the reason I have this big giant one is because when we make whole wheat bread, we also use a scale and we make 20 loaves in a batch. And I had to have a, a scale that went above 11 pounds um, so that, <laughs> that we could get the whole big bucket of flour in. So you just need a small scale and it doesn't cost very much. So uh, next is the millet flour. Like I said, you can grind your own, but you don't have to. They sell millet flour and uh, it works just as well. Um, I will say, do not make millet flour in a Vitamix. Um, you want fine ground millet flour, not coarse. If it's coarse, your uh, bread is not gonna turn out very well. It's gonna have this um, gritty texture and it's gonna be more heavy. So you want fine ground millet flour. Uh, my grinder does a beautiful job, so I'm very happy with it. Uh, but uh, you can use any kind of millet flour you want. So. Uh, I don't know if you're asking you questions because Daniel and Lexi both ran away, but um, so I'm going to keep talking and go ahead and ask your questions. He'll come check the screen, I think. So um, the next is the tapioca flour. If you do not have tapioca flour, you can use arrowroot and uh, it will work fine. Um, so arrowroot and tapioca, they're very interchangeable in this recipe. Um, also, uh, the flaxseed and the chia seed. Those are not replaceable with all one or all the other, unfortunately. I mean, you can do it, but it's going to change the texture of your bread. Everyone asks me, well, can I substitute this? Can I substitute that? Yes, you can, but don't expect to have the same uh, beautiful texture and rising capacity that you have when you follow the recipe exact. Every change that you make, will add to the weight uh, and will change the texture. So if you are um, if you wanna make this recipe, I always say make it exact first and then play around with it. Because, and then when you do play around with it, change one ingredient at a time. Don't just go change them all and say, ah, the bread didn't turn out. No. So change one thing at a time and develop it how you uh, prefer it. So flaxseed, and chia seed, those are precise amounts. Um, you do want some of both. That is your egg and your binder in this recipe. That's what helps hold the bread together since it doesn't have the glue to help you hold it together. Um, then next is uh, the, of course, talk about the chia seed as well. Um, I think Daniel was having problems. Can I help you? Um, I've got one plugged into mine. Is that the one you're looking for? Okay, um, then I'm going to keep going if that's all right, Daniel. Yeah. Um, would you mind uh, keep monitoring the chat messages? Yeah, yeah. If yours is less than 45%, you can switch it to yours. Okay, okay. Um, so, uh, next is the psyllium seed husk. 
That's probably an ingredient that most of you don't use, unless you've heard of Metamucil. Metamucil is made out of psyllium seed husk, but it is finely ground powdered psyllium seed husk. What you want in the bread is the whole husk. You don't want powder, you want whole husk. And this is the one I use. I don't know if you can read that or not. Um, I know the Facebook Live camera is a long ways away, but uh, uh, this is the one I like. It's an organic, organic India, uh, psyllium uh, whole husk fiber. And if you can't get this brand, there are other brands, as long as it says whole husk fiber, then you're okay. If it says powdered, it will not work. It'll turn your bread to a gummy mess. So, well, I did have a battery plugged in there. I didn't realize it wasn't fast. <clears throat> so, uh, that is the psyllium husk. You can see what it looks like. It has a very interesting texture. Let me grab a scoop here so you can see what it looks like. Can you tell me what time it is, Daniel? 6.31. Okay. So, I don't know if you can see this or not. This is what the psyllium husk looks like. It uh, has a very grainy look to it. Um, but what this does, and psyllium husk is amazing for any gluten-free baking when you need something bound together really nicely, uh, because when that hits water, it turns like solid. <laughs> it solidifies. Uh, so this is solidifying your bread and holding it together without that gluten. Um, I use it for herbal poultices. If you take, you know, your herbs and you make a tea out of it and you want to like make it into a poultice, you just put like a tablespoon of psyllium husk and mix it in there and it'll turn it into like a dough. And you can put the poultice anywhere you want. It'll come off clean. You can use it for a charcoal poultice as well. Mix some like half psyllium, half charcoal powder and uh, put that in water and it turns into a dough that doesn't leave any mess, uh, sticky residue or anything. It's wonderful stuff. Um, but that's what we use in the bread to hold the bread dough together. And then of course, I promised I would talk to you about the sugar. I know a lot of you try not to use sugar. If you don't want to use sugar, you can use honey or sorghum molasses, but you will have to do some figuring. And it's fairly simple. Honey and sorghum molasses and maple syrup, all three of those, are 40% water. So you're going to figure out how much you want to put in. Then you're going to put it in grams, right? Then you're going to uh, take out 40% of that. And that's your water that you're adding in. And you're going to the amount, I know this sounds complicated, but it's actually fairly simple. The 40% of the weight of your uh, honey or sorghum molasses or maple syrup, whatever you're using for the bread. Let's, uh, maybe we should give an uh, example. Say we were going to do, it's, it's, uh, let's say we were going to do 45 grams, grams of uh, maple syrup. Okay, so maple syrup is 40% water. How many grams would that be? We'll let Daniel figure this out for us. <laughs> 18 grams. Of 18 water. grams. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your 500 grams of water and you're gonna subtract it by 18. So how many grams of water would we put in, Daniel? 482 grams. Of so water. you'd put 482 grams of water in, and then put your 45 grams of maple syrup or sorghum molasses or honey, whatever you're using, and you will keep the same water ratio. Now, I will warn you one thing. Like I said, this will make the bread a little more heavy. It won't rise quite as much. It won't be quite as fluffy, but it's still good. So that is um, what you can do if you want to replace sugar in this recipe. Um, and then- But you can't leave the sweetener out because the yeast won't. You can't leave it out. You can decrease it a little bit, um, but you need that sugar for the yeast to, to rise. So the more you decrease it, the heavier your bread is gonna be. Um, salt is not optional. The yeast and bread will not rise without the salt. You have to have it in there. Um, and then of course for the yeast, I use an instant yeast. You notice I didn't proof the yeast first before I put it. I put the dry yeast straight in. And uh, I use an instant yeast. Um, I prefer SAF. You can also use Red Star. Um, as long as it says instant yeast, not active yeast, then you should be fine. 
Um, but you need an instant yeast for this recipe. How about, how about that? And that is a dry yeast. Um, you saw me put it in probably. I'll hold it up, hold it up where it was, yeah. We'll just hold that there so we can get that in. Yeah. Got it. All right. So that's a dry yeast. You can see how dry it is. Um, it looks very similar to active yeast, but it does not have to be proofed. It's instant. So uh, the only other ingredients is the olive oil and the water. And I've had a lot of people say, well, can I use applesauce instead of olive oil? The answer is going to be the same thing as all the other. Yes, you can, but it's going to be heavier. And I would probably reduce um, the sugar a little bit uh, if you're going to use applesauce, because applesauce does have some sweetener in it. Um, and, uh, but yes, you can use applesauce instead of oil. Just know it is going to, it's going to spoil faster, and it's also going to um, make, a, make it heavier. But it will be moist, and it will, be, it will taste good. So. so what is the difference between instant and active yeast? Active yeast uh, is more the, what you call the old-fashioned yeast. It used to be the only kind of yeast they had, but it has to be proofed first. Uh, you put it in water with a little bit of um, sweetener and let it bubble up and then you add it in and then you put it in your uh, bread dough and then let it proof again. Um, it needs extra proofing to activate it. Instant yeast is already, they've already done that pre-proofing. It's super activated and so it will activate as instantly as you put it in your bread. So you need to use that instant yeast? You have to, yeah. In the, in the recipe. Yes, yeah. yeah. We covered that when I was talking about the yeast. Yeah. Are there any questions or comments coming through? That was that was one. Let me that was one. All right. Get a few others here. I know I'm going through this quickly, but um, there were some questions. I want to make sure I answer earlier. all the questions. So let's bit, let Daniel look at some of the questions here. Um, you covered you covered the measuring cups of flour as opposed yes. to yes yes we covered the measurements yeah and Rosa had asked about the weight of the bowls and the pans. You covered that. So if there's a question that you've asked and I haven't covered yet, go ahead and ask it now. Um, and then I'll go on. I've talked about the ingredients, um, but I want to make sure that uh, I cover every all the questions. And then we're going to talk about the technique a little bit more. All right, no more questions. Hopefully Daniel will keep monitoring those. Um, we're short staffed today, so we're trying to multitask, so thank you for being with us. <laughs> um, so yes, on the, the recipe, you'll notice it says 500 uh, milliliters of cool water, 68 degrees. And uh, candy thermometers will easily check the water. And I highly recommend that unless you know for sure what temperature your water was when it came out of the tap. And uh, in the winter time, I tend to make it a little bit warmer. I, I can even do it up to 69 or 70 if my flour is cold. It depends on the temperature of your flour. But you never keep the flour if in you, the freezer. If you store your flour in the freezer, you want to use warm water to counteract that, okay? You don't want to use 68 degree water and frozen flour. Your bread's going to take two hours to rise. Um, but if your flour is room temperature, then 68 to 70 degrees is going to be your best. Now, if you live in the summertime and you have no air conditioning and your house is 90 degrees, um, don't make gluten-free bread. No, okay. If you want to make gluten-free bread and your house is 90 degrees, you're going to want to like do like 64 degree water and put a ton of ice cubes in there to try to cool down the dough. Um, because when your house is too hot, you're going to have bubbles. Um, that's kind of the reaction that happens when uh, it's too warm or your dough is too warm. So if your house is warm, cool your dough down. If your house is cold, warm your dough up. Like maybe make it uh, 71 or 72 degrees when you're mixing uh, your water in. That way um, you can make sure that you have a good, you want uh, your dough warm, but not hot. Because what? if that dough is too warm, the yeast will raise so fast that you will have bubbles. What's the temperature of your dough by the time you're, you're um, proofing it there? I don't know, you wanna go get them? Yeah. Every batch is different. So <laughs> I can only tell you what it is today. Today it is 74 degrees in here. We have our air conditioner set at 74. 
and uh, so I'm gonna guess that the dough is gonna be around that temperature. Um, last, what was it, two weeks ago, we were running the heater in here because it was 70 degrees in here. Um, and so in the last two weeks, I've had to change my bread making just because of the difference in temperature of four degrees in the restaurant. Um, Daniel wants to know what it is. It says it's 74 degrees. Well, that's the temperature it's in here. That's what I, isn't that what I said it was gonna be? <laughs> it's gonna be the temperature of your house. <laughs> what time is it? It is 6.40. Okay, so this thing has been raising for probably about 15 minutes, right, at least? Yeah, I didn't, we forgot to set a timer when we Well, started. I asked you what time it was when I was halfway done talking about the ingredients, and it was 6.30. Yeah, so. So I'm gonna We've got guess, about 20 minutes on it, so. I'm gonna guess that it's really close. Um, I want you to see how thick this is, you guys. Like, there's no pancake batter there, all right? This thing's <laughs> solid. Um, you know, like, like my finger can bounce off of it type of solid. Like, this has turned to dough. Um, it hasn't started raising yet, but it's going to because I can see a little bit of a hump starting in the middle. When I raise it for 30 to 35 minutes, which is what it says, set aside for 30 minutes um, at room temperature, you will actually start to see a tiny bit of a hump in the middle at about the 30 minute mark where it starts to actually raise a little bit. I'm going to uh, cut it short by just a tiny bit just because I don't want to go too long in our class tonight. So, um, trying to think. What else do I need to talk about? Oh yes, the, I need to talk about something important, but go ahead, Daniel. One of the things that I was gonna point out about this bread is not only is it gluten-free, but it's also free of all their animal products, um, like everything in our, in our restaurant is. Um, but instead of like eggs or some other things that are often in your, your gluten-free bread, we're putting in several things that add a lot of fiber. <laughs> and that, that gluten-free bread, even though it's not wheat, it's uh, much more equivalent to like a whole wheat bread or a whole grain bread. When you slice it, it, it actually tastes to me, especially if you toast it, it's better toasted. Um, it tastes a lot more like a whole grain slice of, of toast than a lot of your commercial gluten free breads. Yeah, I always tell people when they ask me what the texture of this bread is or how heavy it is or whatever, it's like a European bread. Um, it's got that nice uh, texture, um, it's got like a little bit more of a, a tougher crust on the outside and softer in the middle. Um, it has a very hearty flavor um, and more like a whole grain uh, bread. It's not gonna be your light white sandwich loaf type of bread replacement. This is gonna be your whole grain bread. And as you can see, everything we put in here is whole grain. So um, the other thing, like Daniel said, was the flaxseed and chia seed. Uh, and psyllium has, adds a lot of fiber. And so a lot of people who are diabetic find um, that this type of bread seems to drive their sugar up less because it has so much fiber in it. Did you have a question? Megan asks, what is the shelf life? What is the shelf life of this bread? Okay, um, when it's first baked, uh, you can let it cool on your counter overnight or whatever. Um, you want to probably put it in your refrigerator by the next day. And in the fridge, it will keep for one week. Sometimes you can get the last a week and a half. But uh, basically one week in the refrigerator. This has no preservatives, no chemicals, uh, no dough conditioners. <laughs> um, but if you wanna keep it longer than that, you wanna put it in the freezer. So what I often do, if I'm just gonna eat a little bit of it, is I will slice it fresh, and then I'll put half of it in the freezer and half in the fridge. Or um, here at the restaurant, uh, we don't even use it that fast because we don't have a lot of gluten-free customers asking for like gluten-free garlic toast or gluten-free veggie burgers. So we slice the whole loaf and put it back in the freezer, fully sliced. And then uh, when we want a slice or two slices or three, we just take it out of the freezer, get a butter knife and just gently pry it off the loaf. So, and then just put it in the toaster. And uh, then it will keep for a very long time, a um, month or more in the freezer uh, if it's already sliced and ready to go like that. So that's that's my recommended way to store it uh, because it does dry out in the fridge after a while. So just take out the fridge out of the freezer what you're going to use in a short period of time. 
And like Daniel said, it does taste better toasted, uh, it's, but um, I think it tastes great both ways, especially when it's fresh baked. <laughs> okay. You also use the use the breadcrumbs from the from the gluten free bread to make a lot of gluten free. Yes, we use these gluten free breadcrumbs in our meatballs. We use them in our veggie burgers. We use them in our millet patties, uh, and uh, we use it in our holiday loaf. Um, all of those recipes that call for breadcrumbs, we always use our gluten-free breadcrumbs, and that way all of our uh, loaves and meatballs and patties and whatever else we're making are always gluten-free for anyone who wants to come in and eat them. So if you have a flat batch of gluten-free bread, have no fear. Throw in the food processor, make crumbs out of it, stick it in jars and put it in the freezer, and whenever you have a recipe that calls for breadcrumbs, you've got to make. And then you can try again, make another loaf of bread. <laughs> So the other important part I wanted to talk to you about before we, we interrupt this raising process here is the bread pan. There are two ways that you can bake this. One, you can make it like if you want a European bread, uh, you can just like form the thing into a ball and put it on a cookie sheet and bake in the oven just like that. But if you want a nice sandwich bread, um, then this is the bread pan that I recommend. And if you go, um, let me see if I, where do I have it here? I'm looking at uh, my recipe. I might need to put it back in there. Um, yeah, I need to put it back in there. I used to have it in my recipe. I will put the link back in. But if you go to King Arthur Flour, King Arthur Flour and look up their gluten-free bread pan. Um, they only have one and this is it. And the difference is, and why I like it for gluten-free bread, I don't use it for anything else, just gluten-free bread, is because it's one inch narrower and it's one inch taller than your standard loaf of bread. Also, you know, as you'll notice, of course, this is a very well-used pan, right? <laughs> you'll notice it has ridges in the steel and those ridges actually help the heat conduct more thoroughly so that the middle of your loaf is not spongy. Uh, it helps it to cook all the way through to the center of the loaf, uh, which makes it much better texture. And uh, so because it's one inch taller, it supports the bread while it's raising, so it doesn't fall over. Um, so the bread will actually raise, this loaf of bread will raise to the top and slightly heap above the top. Um, and it usually takes about 30 minutes, depending on the heat of your... <laughs> I've had it take as little as 10 minutes and as, more, as much as 30 minutes. Um, depending on the temperature in your kitchen. But um, about 30 minutes for it to raise and you just let it raise until you just see it peaking above the top of the pan and you know it's done raising. Um, the bread pans are an investment, but they last forever. So uh, if you're going to make, um, oh, <laughs> it feels like it. <laughs> I, I've been using them for like uh, eight years. I haven't seen any sign of wear on them yet. Um, but uh, if you're going to make this batch, I suggest making the one loaf recipe. You can just buy one pan if you want. Um, or if you want to make a larger batch, uh, once you have practiced with one loaf, uh, the maximum capacity of a bowl for a recipe is three loaves. That's the most you want to make in one bowl. So here at the restaurant, we have 12 pans. That means I can make 12 loaves in a batch, but it does not mean I make 12, a 12 loaf batch in one bowl. Because you saw how I was stirring that, trying to get the lumps out within 30 seconds. A three loaf batch is the maximum you can do. So if I need to make 12 loaves, I do four bowls. So four bowls with the same ingredients in each one, mix them individually, and uh, then I don't have to worry about it clumping um, or my bread not turning out. Um, if I need to make 24 loaves of bread, then I make a second batch. Uh, 12 loaves is about the maximum I can handle with getting them in the pans because they raise very quickly so that they all raise about the same height. Um, unless you have two people forming them into loaves very fast. Um, and even then, 12 is about the max you can handle. So um, it's not easy to do gigantic batches, but it's very nice for small, small batches and um, it takes a little bit of time, but it's so worth it. Uh, if you are stuck buying gluten-free bread from the store, I always said, 
most gluten-free bread you buy in the store, I'm not gonna say all, but most. Most gluten-free gluten -free bread, if I can talk today, that you buy in the store is like chewable cardboard. <laughs> That's what I call it. Because it has no taste at all. But this has flavor uh, because of that whole grain and that good flavor. What time is it, Daniel? It is 6.50. Okay. Tanya good. wants to know how many do you make in a typical week? How many do I make a week? Um, I usually make it every other week. So about every two weeks we make um, either 9 or 12 loaves. And um, some sometimes it will go less than that. Sometimes I might be able to go three weeks. But usually it's every other week. Um, so I usually do whole wheat bread one week and gluten free bread the next week. Um, I don't ever make them on the same day obviously for cross contamination reasons. But it has been our, uh, about 30 minutes almost since we put this in the pan. You can just barely see a little bit of a hump starting to form, not a lot. Um, Lexi, I don't know where she went. Daniel, you're gonna have to help me here. Right. I need a cutting board because I forgot to get that. I'm gonna use that to knead on. So we can see what to do. All right, I'm just gonna see how it look pretty. <laughs> if you guys have any more questions, feel free to holler. I'm excited for you to see what this dough looks like because you saw how wet it was, uh, you saw how runny it was. Uh, I just need a cutting board, and uh, I can't wait for you to see what it looks like. <laughs> this dough, like most of your gluten free bread recipes that you find, are like this. Um, it's like cake batter and you just pour it into a bread pan and you know you bake it and whatever but because uh, this is not like cake batter you can do almost anything you want to bring them up closer they can see what i'm doing you want to help them lexi with the other camera i want them to see this nice and close to see what's going on here because this is not like cake batter you can do anything you want with this like you can Form this out into uh, cinnamon rolls. Um, you can make dinner rolls with it. Um, then you can make pizza dough with it. The sky's the limit what you can do. So, take a look at this. Now, when I first pull it out, it's like, what on earth did I do? Like, it's like coming out in pieces. It doesn't look like bread dough at all. It looks really weird. And it's because there's no gluten. Because guess what? Gluten is what holds dough together, and this is gluten-free. So, the other thing I always have to tell people is you do not have to knead this bread. You simply need to form it together. Because you know when you're kneading bread, you're developing the gluten, right? So you do like fold, stretch, fold, stretch. You're not going to do that with this stuff because you're not developing the gluten. There's no gluten. There's no gluten in there. So. I always get a handful of flour, put a little bit of flour on it. Um, and obviously I normally just do this on the counter, not on a cutting board, but um, I wanna make sure it has a perfectly clean surface here. So you can see what I'm doing here. I'm just pulling it and smashing it. I'm not like folding over and stretching or anything like that. I simply just roll it to a ball and smash it. Um, and see how nice it's turning? Like, look, look at that. Like bread dough. It's starting to look like bread dough now. Um, and you do not have to do it very much, but you don't have to worry about being gentle with this stuff. You can't murder it. Like, you can't hurt gluten free bread dough. Um, it's not going to turn tough if, like, the main, the main secret that you always want to know is if the outside of the dough feels really sticky, then you need a little bit more flour on your counter. If it's sticking to your fingers or it's sticking to the counter, give it a little more flour. And uh, that's the biggest thing to keep the nice texture is, uh, look at that. Look at that, you guys. Isn't that incredible? Like, Ta it's, it's Tanya bread says, dough. <laughs> Tanya says I need bread all the time. In, in EED. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Tanya, you live close enough. You can come get it anytime you want. I don't mind. <laughs> but, um, like, seriously, like, you can uh, smash this out. Roll it out with a rolling pin if you need to. Just make sure you put plenty of flour on it. Um, roll it up into uh, uh, rolls. You can make braided bread with it, dinner rolls with it. I mean, as long as you're careful, the sky's the limit what you can do with this bread dough. 
So, um, I, I think I forgot the spray oil, Lexi. That's the one thing I forgot. So, I'm going to show you how to shape it. She's got it where they can see it, right? Yeah. Okay. And that, you got it where you can see over there? I'm going to shape it into a loaf now. So, I'm going to show you how I do it. I'm going to show you my technique. So, I've showed you already the smashing into a ball. I've got a nice ball now. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull it over like I'm rolling up a, a taco or something. Kind of shape it into the, the loaf that I want. And this is going to be the bottom, okay? I'm going to take this and I'm going to roll it to kind of help shape the top of the bread there. And we're going to flip it over. This is going to be the top of my loaf now, right? So I am going to spank it into place. I'm not going to worry about stretching it or pulling it or anything. I'm simply just going to spank it until it looks pretty. Spank all the wrinkles out of it. Is that what you do to kids? Leave all your frustrations you don't have to do it to your kids. Yeah. When I spank it, I'm using uh, my fingers, just kind of doing a spanky motion with the tips of my fingers, not with the palm of my hand. All right, and then I'm just going to shape it into the loaf that I want. Look at that, isn't that pretty? So we're going to take our spray oil here. We're going to spray our pan. And we're going to stick that in. So there it is. Now, you see how low it is? It's a, it fills the pan about half full. And like I said, it's going to raise until it's just to the top of the pan, and then you'll put it in the oven. I don't think there's time for us to let it sit for another 30 minutes. Well, it's raising, but I think you can get the picture. So I'm going to send this with Lexi to the kitchen, and she's going to go stick it in the oven and bring it back out. Can you stick one in the oven here? I want you to see what it looks like when it's finished. You got to see the finished product. I'm going to need a knife to cut, too. This is the exciting part, you guys. Like, it looks like bread. So we're putting everyone in a time machine to go forward. <laughs> long, how long does it raise again? 30 minutes? It takes about 30 minutes to raise and almost an hour to bake. All right, so 90 minutes. Let's see if I can do a help her here. Time machine yeah, got, yeah, got Time it. machine time got machine. stuck. Time machine's here. All right. Yes, thank you. There it is. What's that? Just leave it. Leave it on camera. See oh, how gotta, beautiful that we looks? Gotta, we gotta do this today. It's even warm. <laughs> 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 so, I gotta wash the dough off my fingers. So, you can just like look at that loaf and drill over it for a second, okay? Just my fingers are all sticking out. So, we have a question. Okay, what's that? Can you make this loaf smaller? I only have regular bread pans from Walmart. Should I wait till I get the bread pans from Arthur's website? Um, we can't hear you, so you have to come back. <laughs> I'm coming. So, my answer to that question would be, uh, go ahead and make it. Um, in the regular pan if you want, or like I said, you can put in a big ball on a cookie sheet if you really want to try this right away. But if you're not in a hurry to try it, it does make a better texture in this uh, pan. So order the pan right away. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have to let it cool before you remove it from the pan? Uh, you actually don't. You can take it out of the pan instantly, uh, but if you don't have a rack ready, uh, sometimes I'll pull it out of the oven and I'll leave it on the counter for like five minutes while I'm getting my racks ready and whatever, and then I take it out of the pans. But it can it can go either way. If you're in a hurry, you can take it out immediately, or you can let it sit ten minutes like you do um, cakes or cookies or whatever. But it's a fairly solid loaf. How warm should your room temperature be when you're letting the bread rise? Uh, between seventy to seventy-four degrees is actually your best. Uh, when it's hotter than that, it is going to have more bubbles actually fairly cool then. 
to some people that's hot, so I don't know about it. I don't, I don't know that we call that cool. <laughs> All right, there's your loaf of gluten-free bread. I want you guys to see what it looks like, so I'm gonna cut it. But at least uh, you got an idea of how high it was above the pan when you saw it there, right? So we're just going to slice this here so you can see what it looks like. I want you to see how amazing this is. It's nice and crusty right now because it's still warm from the oven. <laughs> you can you don't have to toast it or anything you can eat it warm it's amazing um, but it does tend to dry out a little bit more as it cools especially if you put it in the fridge so um, the next day you always want to make sure you toast it um, or heat it up in the toaster oven or whatever um, to eat it but it is absolutely amazing and it is it's like real whole grain bread I read it I read it see you gotta see if it's edible, it's edible. It's edible. Yeah. He, he's gonna demonstrate this <laughs> Sure you didn't put weed in it? <laughs> hey, could you make this into cinnamon rolls? I have. You've eaten them. I have. They're pretty good too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're really good as cinnamon rolls. Um, but my favorite, honestly, with this, because it has such a distinct flavor, my favorite is savory. Uh, it makes the best garlic toast in the whole wide world. Uh, we put a little coconut oil on it and some salt and some garlic powder. And if you want, you can add some nutritional yeast or parsley or whatever and toast it in the toaster oven. And it is the best garlic toast, hands down, that you ever had. Like, just incredible. Um, I prefer it savory over sweet, but it's good both ways. So, any other questions? Gary, can't wait to, to be here and, and when you're doing these in person. Well, I can't wait until you guys are going to be here too because I hate talking to cameras. <laughs> Oh. I want to see real people. Um, but, but, um, I want to answer Morgan, that. Morgan wants to know about seeing the sponginess, the texture of the bread by, by poking a slice a little bit. Here. By poking it? Okay. Here, let me get the camera. Let's get it nice and close get here. Get the camera up close so you can kind of... Hold on, let me get it zoomed in so you can kind of see that texture. Right now, of course, it's warm because it's fresh from the oven. So it's more spongy right now than it is once it cools. It's more spongy, but it, it actually has less rebound like a... So as you as she's squishing it, it's, it's not popping back up quite as much as a wheat bread, but it's not bad. I mean, it's not, it's not squishing. Actually, that's part of... I don't know what effect. Turn it, turn it up. So, yeah, it, did, it didn't destroy the bread just doing that. No, no, the bread's fine. I haven't done anything to, to hurt the bread at all. Yeah, so kind of get an idea of the texture. The best thing is just to eat it. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry you can't but eat it. <laughs> yeah, I know Morgan. Morgan's in Oklahoma, so she can't just come over here and eat it. But you can try making them, Morgan. <laughs> so, um, now I'm trying to... Oh, yes, Gary wanted to know when we were going to have in-person classes again. Mm -hmm. Our plan is to start in-person classes this summer um, as soon as flu season is over and the county gets out of the red zone. So uh, stay tuned. I'm guessing it'll be a couple more months, um, but we will start in-person classes. We have enough space in here that we can social distance. And uh, so I think that is going to happen soon. So hang on tight and keep watching us for a couple more months on Facebook Live. Um, are there any other questions? So I think we're just about done. No more questions? A lot of people saying thank you. Wow. Thank you guys for joining us. I had so much fun. I hope you had fun with me. Sorry I had to fly through everything to get it all in, but we got it. And uh, please join us again next month on the third Tuesday of every month at 6 p.m. We'll do another live class. And as you noticed, I said this was gluten-free baking part one. Uh, next month, we'll be doing gluten-free baking part two. And it won't be bread, it'll be uh, probably more dessert related, um, but it'll be in the baking 
hopefully either muffins or cookies or somewhere along that line. So um, anyway, stay tuned with us next month. Mark your calendars, plan to join us. And uh, Daniel, would you be willing to have a word of prayer to close us out? Now that you got your mouth full. Yeah. <laughs> it has a really good flavor. I didn't put anything on it. You can see. It's like almost like a nutty flavor. It does. It has a, because of the flaxseed that she is. Ah, it that's what nut, it is. It has a nutty flavor. Nut flavor. <laughs> I'm just glad you're enjoying yeah. it. <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for each one who has been uh, able to participate in this class. Thank you for your blessings towards us. And I pray that you'll bless each one now until we meet again. And in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you again. Hugs to everybody. I look forward to seeing you next time. God until bless. Then, God bless you.